Hello everyone, my name is Jen Nolan. I'd like to warmly welcome you to our webinar this evening on osteoporosis and osteopenia. I would like to begin, however, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting, the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'm very happy to provide you with our list, list of free community webinars for 2022. Apart from our great webinar tonight, we have a diverse list of topics and issues, including joint surgery, complementary therapies, and the impact of musculoskeletal conditions on intimate relationships. While many of you watching tonight will already be registered for the full webinar series, others can register for any or all of our webinars via our website. If you haven't previously viewed Musculoskeletal Australia's website, I strongly suggest you do so. In line with our focus on empowering consumers through education and support, we have a wide range of information, videos, webinars, tools and services, including our national helpline that is available via email and phone on 1800 263 265. Also, while you're visiting our website, check our online shop. It has a wide range of aids, gadgets, books and other resources to assist you in your daily activities. Our presenter for this evening is Dr. Sonia Davison. Sonia is an endocrinologist with a special interest in women's health. She's a clinical fellow at Jean Howes for Women's Health and has an adjunct appointment at the Women's Health Research Program, Monash University, Victoria, Australia. Sonia is in private practice at the Melbourne Endocrine Clinic and at Jean Howes for Women's Health. Her PhD and postdoctoral research examines sex steroid physiology in women including measurement of androgens and their relationships with age, mood, sexual function and cognition. Sonia is president of the Australasian Menopause Society. We're extremely grateful to Sonia for presenting this evening's webinar. And without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to, uh, over to Sonia. Thanks very much, Sonia. Um, thank, thank you so much. I, I'm very happy to be having uh, the honour of presenting tonight. Uh, I'm delighted that people are interested in their bone health and it's always an honour to be asked to present. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of a journey with regard to our bone health, uh, with a particular focus on osteopenia and osteoporosis. When we consider normal bone, uh, you'll see the happy skeleton over there. Bones are necessary uh, for our body uh, to work how it, how it should do. They're our support, uh, they're our mechanism for holding us up and they protect vital structures. So our bodies have 206 bones uh, in them if we're formed correctly. Sometimes we lose a few and sometimes it's a little bit askew. And what the bones do is they protect us, they keep us up. For example, your uh, skull is a sort of a natural helmet uh, protecting our very vital brain inside. If we didn't have that, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, so the bone consists of bone marrow which is all of the cells which make blood cells, things that uh, fight infection, keep us uh, from being anemic and those sort of things. The bone is very active and metabolically rich and the bone has supporting cells uh, which are important for that structural element. So we have connective tissue, we have calcium reinforcement and we have specialised cells as well. So bones are not like you if you go to the supermarket and buy a bone for your dog for example, they are not like that. Our bones are active, living, uh, they're very uh, active uh, parts of our body. And most of our calcium supplies are found within the body. And I'll go on to the next slide, please. So normal bone development. So I've talked about the fact that they're metabolically active, they're capable of repair, which I think some of you will be listening or uh, watching tonight because you might have bones that have had a fracture, or you might have osteopenia or osteoporosis or relatives uh, with that and you might be worried about bone. So bones, when you do damage them, they can repair. That's a good uh, design uh, characteristic, I think, and, and very useful. Um, so bones are always remodeling and there are two types of cells basically which are doing this. There are the osteoblasts which grow bone uh, and repair it and there are osteoclasts which, which gobble away at bone. And what I normally say to ladies is that bones are growing, and men, of course, bones are growing and bones are losing. It's always a competing process. Um, and bones reach a, a peak bone mass, 
or density. And we don't really know when this is, but we think it's about 25 to 30 years of age. So when I talk to my patients, I say, well, bones grow until you're 25 to 30, and after that, the loss of bones occurs. And that's a natural thing. We are designed to lose bone as we age. Uh, and there's generally about a 0.3 to 0.5% reduction in bone density per year, but it is programmed and it will be programmed for you specifically. Next slide, thank you. So when we're looking at osteoporosis, uh, this is when we've lost density. So it is normal to lose density with age, as you've just seen, uh, but osteoporosis is when you get to a critical mass of bone. Bones are much more fragile and with a minimal trauma, uh, you can have a fracture. And I've got lots of stories about this, but I'll start with the lady who slipped on a bean at Safeway or one of those supermarkets. I shouldn't, I shouldn't, it's not even called that anymore. Uh, but she slipped on a bean in the supermarket in the fruit section. She fell, she smashed her whole hip, she needed a whole hip uh, replaced. So this can happen, uh, we are at risk of doing this if we have thin enough bones. And I always uh, am worried about when the orthopedic surgeons tell me, oh, this bone was as thin as eggshell. So you can't support your whole weight on uh, bones that are as thin as an eggshell. Um, and this is a silent process. So your bones may be thinning there, but you might not feel it until you have a fracture or until you do a scan. And the doctor might say, well, you've actually got some osteopenia or osteoporosis. You normally will not feel any osteoporosis until there's a fracture. Next slide, please. So this is very prevalent because we're living uh, at a, to an older age. In 1845, uh, the median age for Australian women was 45. So we weren't getting to the point where we were getting osteopenic and osteoporotic. We weren't living long enough. We were dying of malnutrition, you know, infectious diseases, those sort of things. Um, but 50% of elderly women in developed countries will eventually have osteoporosis. And there is rapid bone loss in the years surrounding menopause. So you'll normally lose, remember we said before, up to 0.5% per year after 30 years of age. That will increase to 1% to 3% per year. Um, and especially around menopause, it does tail off a little bit after that. So there's an acceleration. If you already have thin bones and then go through perimenopause or menopause, your bones will be a lot thinner. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a picture to show you what, what bones look like. Um, you'll see on the left there at the top, there's that nice spiculated appearance. So that's, it's not wholly within your, uh, your bone. There will be packed with blood and with limbs and with blood cells that are developing. But on the right up the top there, you'll see what happens. It's like a rat got in and ate away at the bone. You can see the structure's not there. You can see the holes are bigger. And if that's designed to keep us from standing up and taking our whole weight, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. And you can see on the bottom there that the hip, that's the hip bone. The round bit there is where the hip uh, supports in, into the pelvis. And see that very narrow part after the ball bit? That's the neck of the hip. The neck of the hip is something that can very easily fracture because it's taking the weight of the upper half of our body from the sort of pelvis up onto that very small area. And it's all about force and torque and physics and all of that sort of stuff. But if that gets very thin and you have a fall or someone else has a fall, it's at risk of fracture. So that's why people fracture their neck of femur or their neck of hip. And you can see there that it looks a little bit rat eaten on the bottom there. Um, and we don't want that. We want bones to stay nice and thick and, and healthy and dense. But I'll go on to the next slide and we'll talk about how we can do that. So lots of people uh, eventually will have a fracture if they get old enough um, and have osteoporosis. So one in two women over 60 years. I know you'll be sitting there and thinking, oh, I don't like that. One in three men over 60 years. So not as prevalent in men, but still as we're getting older and we're probably not weight bearing as much, uh, I think, and vitamin D getting low, et cetera, we'll talk about those things, but we're at risk of fracture and we're at risk of bone thinning. 46% are spine fractures and up to a third of people will not know if they've had a spine fracture and that's scary in itself. So they'll be very surprised when they look at an x-ray and they've actually had a fracture. People can lose height with age. They can do that because the discs get less washy and because they might have a fracture of the spine they don't know about. 16% are hip and wrist fractures and the uh, importance here is that a quarter of people statistically 
will die in the year after a wrist a hip fracture, I'm sorry, because usually they're old and frail, but also because they go to hospital, they might get an infection, they might get a clot, they might get pneumonia or a complication. So really we want to keep the bones as healthy as we can, avoid hospitalizations and avoid major fractures. Um, and we, we don't want that. And part of this webinar is talking about how we can avoid that. Next slide, please. Osteopenia is mild thinning of the bones. So if you think of diabetes and pre-diabetes being a precursor step to diabetes, osteopenia is mild thinning of the bones. There shouldn't be a risk of fracture, but it is a precursor step to osteoporosis. So if we can grab things at the osteopenia uh, part of it, then we're, you know, we can make a better intervention than if we've just got to osteoporosis. Uh, so, so I'm always keen to try and grab bones at the osteopenic stage and try and keep them there or try and make them a bit better. Um, but remember that any bones can fracture. So if you have a young eight-year-old who jumps off the roof pretending he's Superman, he can fracture. So even the strongest bones with enough force like a skiing accident or whatever, can fracture, but you want to do your best to try and avoid that. Next slide, please. So the World Health Organization has made some uh, definitions here with regard to osteoporosis and osteopenia, and not to get too caught up in these because they do get complicated, uh, but in terms of osteopenia, we're talking about standard deviations. So if you remember, if you've ever done statistics at uni or whatever, there's a bell curve of normality, which looks like a bell. And if you're interested in statistics, this is fascinating. Most people in a bell curve of normality sit within a certain range. It's those people at the extreme. So osteopenia uh, is outside of this part of the normal part, and osteoporosis is right on the side. So it's that we, we base this uh, diagnosis on a T-score. A T-score for osteopenia is anything from negative one to negative 2.5. And that means that that person is one to two and a half standard deviations from the normal peak bone mass in a young healthy adult. Whereas osteoporosis is two and a half standard deviations away from that. And what it really means is that you've got a T-score of negative 2.5 or less, that is osteoporosis by definition. If you've got a T-score on a DEXA scan of negative one to negative 2.5, it's osteopenia. But if you've got a T-score better than negative one, you are normal. Uh, and that is brilliant and that's what I'm aiming for. Uh, we might not get there, but osteopenia is also pretty good. Next slide, please. So there's a, there's a level at which you can have a fracture and I don't mean to complicate things and you'll see there there is a, a bar for men and a bar for women. Uh, and the women there are, are lower than men. So there's a threshold of fracture. You'll see there are the age is at the bottom of that graph. Age is getting older to the, to the right of that graph. You'll see their bones increase in density. And then as you, there's a slippery slope down to the right as bones decrease in their density as we're getting older. Um, and essentially what this slide is saying that women reach their fracture threshold earlier because they're losing bone at a more rapid rate, especially after menopause. So this is the real uh, time that I try and focus on bone health around the time of menopause, because uh, we can identify these uh, women who have bone thinning and we can intervene then. And I'll go on to the next slide, please. So the factors that are affecting our bone mass. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, as the case may be, most of this is genetic. So up to 85% of what your bones are doing, and I suspect some of you are listening purely because you are worried about mum who has had osteoporosis or a grandmother or whatever, but genetics is most of bone. Um, racial, there are some differences there, and also interestingly, geographic and weight. But also the environment is very important. So on the left there at the bottom, when we're attaining bone density, uh, there are hormonal considerations, so that my ladies who have anorexia, for example, have very low estrogen levels, they are at risk of osteopenia and osteoporosis, even at a very young age, even from the 20s or, or younger than that in some of my ladies. Physical activity is very important. So if you think we're designed to have two feet to stand on them, 
Unfortunately, my ladies who might be in a wheelchair, especially my disabled ladies uh, who have, you know, can't move, can't weight bear, they will have low bone density just because they're not weight bearing. They're not doing what the skeleton intended to. And also diet. If you're malnourished, if you don't have enough calcium, we're going to go through those things in a minute, though, so don't panic about that. But on the right side of the, uh, the slide, you'll see after peak bone mass is achieved. So these are the very important things that you can alter. So smoking is very important. Alcohol, too much, you're allowed to have a bit. Physical activity, and that's weight bearing. I'm going to take you through that in detail later. Hormones are important to some degree. Estrogen, sometimes testosterone for men. And when we're talking about uh, prostatic cancer treatment, when we're trying to reduce the testosterone levels, that's where bone can be a real issue here. Vitamin D is important. I'm going to go through that later. Diet's very important in terms of calcium intake. And guess what? I'm going to go through that later. Next slide, please. So who is at risk? Um, well, we're all at risk if we're getting old enough and uh, if we get old. Uh, but also family history we talked about, inadequate calcium, smokers. So my first lady uh, as a doctor who I really had a bad fracture of the spine, she was hospitalised. Uh, the thing that she did, she tried to lift a wardrobe, which is not always a good idea, but she'd been healthy throughout life. The only risk factor she had that I could identify for osteoporosis was cigarette smoking. And she was hospitalized for six weeks because she fractured her spine acutely. Uh, so don't smoke is, is my answer to you if you're a smoker, if you want to keep your spine healthy and your heart and your brain. <laughs> um, alcohol, more than two standard drinks. Coffee, you can have up to three cups. Not More than that, you can impact bone. Lack of exercise that's weight bearing. Early menopause, so before the age of 45. Premature menopause before 40, that's a sort of specialist area. Having a thin or small body frame, I know you can't help that, but you are going to be at risk. And the way that they got those population tables for DEXA scans and for knowing about osteopenia and osteoporosis, they just did a whole lot of bone density scans in thousands of people and then said, this is the normal population and this is what we consider to be normal at this cutoff and this is what we consider to not be normal. So if you do have a thin and small body frame, you might fit outside of that uh, sort of rubric. And those with an Asian uh, heritage, if you're living in a predominantly Caucasian country, for example, you might not fit in those bone density scan limits. Uh, you might be a little bit different. So, so it is important to look at the population. Um, lack of exposure to sunlight, it's mostly about vitamin D. Late first period or with a long time without periods, uh, that's important for some women, especially if they're uh, breastfeeding babies for a long time. Long time use of certain medications, I'll go through that in a minute, and increasing age, which we talked about. And I'm going to uh, say next slide, please. So what is the role of oestrogen? Uh, so I'm a women's health expert, I see lots of ladies. Uh, the role of oestrogen is very important for bone to have oestrogen, uh, but it is normal to undergo menopause at the median age of 51 to 52 when your oestrogen levels plummet and you may or may not have symptoms. So when the oestrogen levels plummet, that protective effect on bones uh, goes away and so bones will start to lose. So, so we lose bone density and there is an increase in osteoporosis, osteopenia and fracture, but also in other oestrogen deficiency states, such as anorexia we talked about, pituitaries that don't work very well and also excessive exercise. So if you see your marathon runner, uh, you think, oh, running's good for bone health. If they get too skinny and if they turn periods off if they're women, they can start to have uh, stress fractures uh, and they can actually have thin bones. So with bone health, it's always best to be somewhere in the middle. The outliers, those who are too thin or too big, uh, those who do too much exercise or too little, they're the ones uh, that osteoporosis or osteopenia tends to be a problem with. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide, please. So osteoporosis, bone loss is programmed for a given individual. It is dependent on your race, your genetics, everything else. But disease processes can speed up that bone loss uh, and Medicare has recognised this. That's why some of the DEXA scans will be covered if you have the following illnesses or diseases, but they won't be covered otherwise and you might have to pay out of pocket if you wish to have a DEXA scan or a bone density scan performed and you don't have these conditions because Medicare doesn't give an item number for them. So overactive thyroid, 
Uh, well-treated thyroid is not going to impact your, your bone health. I'll say that now. If you're on thyroxin, your dose is steady, you're going to be doing all right. Celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease, cancer or cancer treatment, kidney or liver disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, anorexia nervosa, I've talked a bit about, and poor nutrition generally. And some people just have uh, IBS or terrible issues with their gut and just can't absorb calcium and have years worth of trouble. Uh, it's not their fault, but we've got to make sure that the bones uh, are okay. Next slide, please. So some, yep, excellent. Some medications can lead to bone density loss. Uh, so prednisolone or oral steroids at high dose for long-term use, anything up to five milligrams of prednisolone is considered replacement prednisolone for the body. Our bones can handle that. It's when you're on a long-term prednisolone, maybe for asthma or whatever, at high doses, that's when bones can suffer. Some anti-epileptic medications can affect bones as well. Some cancer drug, uh, thyroid hormone, remember, remember it's excessive dose. If you need thyroxin for your underactive thyroid and your levels are controlled, this won't affect your bone. Some blood thinners, we don't use much of heparin or warfarin now, but some of you may be on those. Some hormonal treatments, so there's a contraceptive called Depo-Provera uh, that is very useful for not having periods and for avoiding uh, children and that you have that every three months if you're a girl and reproductive and if you want it, but it can thin bones over, over time. Uh, and some, as I said before, treatments for prostate cancer, the anti-androgens that block testosterone. When a male loses testosterone, his bones can suffer, like a lady will uh, with menopause. Uh, some diuretics and some proton pump inhibitors. And I know some people listening and watching this will be on medications called PPIs, uh, things like omeprazole, uh, pantoprazole, those sort of things. These are the ones in studies that have really made the biggest impact on bone and they are ezomeprazole and rebeprazole, but they're not making an enormous impact on bone. So do not stop those medications you might need for other reasons, and do not be worried about the effect on bone, um, but be guided by a specialist if you're worried about that, or your GP if they're good at bone health. Next slide, thank you. When we're looking at diagnosis of osteoporosis, as I mentioned before, it's a DEXA scan. So it's a dual energy X-ray absorbiometry scan, which is hard to say, so we call it a DEXA, D-E-X-A, or just D-X-A. Your doctor would need to refer you for that. Some people have heel ultrasounds at the chemist. That's like driving the old mini minor compared to the DEXA scan, which is the Rolls Royce. So don't depend on the heel ultrasound for a diagnosis of osteoporosis or osteopenia. If you do get a, a measure there that says thinning, go and confirm it. But if it's normal and you worry about osteoporosis, get a DEXA scan. Uh, you can't rely on those heel ultrasound tests. So what they do is they get two beams of x-rays that are different energies. They put them through the bone. It's actually just like having a normal x-ray. It doesn't take very long, about 15, 20 minutes. You won't feel anything. You don't need injections or contrast or whatever. And what they do is they absorb out the soft tissue and actually tell us how dense the bones are by canceling out everything else. A bit fascinating. I'm going to take you through some pictures. Hopefully they work. Uh, next slide, thank you. So I just thought I'd take you through because I know people love their scans. And these are real people. I've de-identified them. Um, and this lady, happily enough, has normal bone density. Uh, so she, you can see there the black picture is a picture of her spine. And by convention, we do L1 to L4, lumbar first to second to third to fourth vertebra. The fifth vertebra is fused to the sacrum. So it's, we don't get very reliable pictures there, but you will get very reliable pictures of the spine in population studies. And that's why we do that area uh, as, a, as a priority. It does reflect what's happening with other bones, but other bones are less reliable in terms of measuring them. So you'll see that nice straight skeleton there, lovely uh, square bones, lovely density, nice white picture. So osteopenic bones on an x-ray tend to be blacker. There's not as much calcium and then on this white. And you'll see there in the colored bit on the top right of the slide, there's the green, the yellow, and the red. It's just like a traffic light. See there's three black lines there that go on and they're going down uh, to, towards the right of the screen. That's the projected normal rate of bone loss. You want to be somewhere between those three bands. 
And you can see that happily enough, this lady has an excellent little Josh there. That's where she's appearing and her bones are normal. And I don't think you're going to see this very often. It's always a, a really relief for me because I don't have to worry about anything uh, when the bones look like that. I'll have the next slide, please. This is the hip. And again, you can see there's the hip, there's the ball and socket uh, delivery of the hip. The x-rays on the left, you don't rely on that. It's not a very clear picture. It's just a guide to show us what they do with the hip. They do different readings. So you get at the neck of the hip, you get the total hip, and you get an area in the middle called the Ward's triangle. Uh, it does get a bit complicated. People get hung up on different things. The Ward's triangle region will always be the worst region. Um, sometimes it's not. But you don't base decisions based on the Ward's triangle. And you'll see there that that dot's nicely appearing there in the green, uh, and this one that has normal bone density at the hip. Next slide, please. So this is osteopenia uh, at the spine. And if you can see there, it's, it's very difficult to see, I know, uh, but that you can see the picture of the spine on the left, not the important thing. It's where the person appears on the graph. Uh, and you can see on the graph there uh, that the, the, when, when you have a dot that appears in the yellow, uh, that is osteopenia. Uh, and we want those bones to actually be, well, osteopenia is not bad. You don't have a tendency to fracture. Um, the other important thing there is sometimes you'll get two dots on the screen and you'll be able to see uh, that there's a change with treatment. So you can see on the left of that uh, colored scan up to the, on the right side, you'll have one dot onto the side that was their first scan and the next dot uh, is the scan, the, the dot over to the right in the yellow part of the screen. And this is a happy thing because what happens is this person's been pretty stable over time, over a number of years from between the DEXA scans. And of course, we want this because we don't want our bones to become thin. We, we want them to, to stay an even a steady result. If you've had a bone density here and a bone density here, if it's steady, it means you've avoided that loss of bone, which I always find quite exciting. But the next slide, please. And again, this is osteopenia at the hip. Uh, again, you're going to appear in the yellow with your little dot there, and you'll be able to see uh, that there's been an improvement there. So if you see onto the right side where the colored, the green, yellow, and red graph is the top right hand of the screen, that the initial reading there was close to osteoporosis, close to the red, that line was going to go down just with age alone. So whatever strategies this person has done, treatment, hormone therapy, vitamin D, calcium, exercise, they've managed to not only uh, stop the loss of bone, but they've actually had a nice improvement on a subsequent scan. Next slide, please. And this is osteoporosis at the spine. Uh, I actually had to struggle to find some osteoporosis because uh, my ladies are doing pretty well. But you can see there the dot is appearing uh, in the red part there on the, on the colored one in the middle. But you'll also excitedly see if you canny enough, on the right side with those, the black line going up, you'll see that they were more osteoporotic and with whatever treatment we've done, they are less osteoporotic as time went on. And this is always a real win. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a very, very shady picture. I couldn't find any osteoporosis hip in my recent ladies. But again, uh, the dot there is in the red. You don't want the dot in the red. You want it to be in the yellow. And another important part of these uh, DEXA scans is a Z score. So we've talked about the T scores being negative 1 to negative 2.5 for osteopenia or less than negative 2.5 for osteoporosis. A Z score compares you to your age group. And it's very important to have a Z score that's about zero. So that means that you haven't lost bone uh, compared to your peers. And I'm always aiming for a good T-score if I can, but especially a good Z-score, which means if you're zero, you're exactly what your peers should be doing, and that's always a good move. I'll go on to the next slide, please. Uh, so this is the uh, effect of treatment. So I thought that this was very nice to have a look at. And you can see there onto the right side, the colored one with the green, yellow, and red, this is the spine. You can see the dot onto the left there uh, went up a little bit. Whatever treatment happened or whatever they did uh, was, was good. Then there was a dip in the middle, so they went backwards for whatever reason. Then things started to improve and then tailed off a bit. But uh, remember, bones were always going to go downhill like that. 
Uh, so this is actually a real win. They, they actually remained within osteopenic range and it was pretty steady over a number of years. Next slide, please. And again, at the hip, you can see this is the same person. They did a very similar thing, but this person avoided, importantly, a deterioration in bone density as they went along and they avoided getting osteoporosis and having much worse bone density. And I always say that if people are steady and people have improved, that's a real win for bone. Uh, if they're getting, if it's still osteoporosis, then work needs to be done. Next slide, thank you. Uh, and again, this is uh, a really interesting one because you'll see there, uh, we were plodding along, I think there was a problem with a dental issue or something, and there was a real dip, if you see the, the graph on the right side. That's the, that's the DEXA scan result as they go along those dots. There was a real dip at some point, and then whatever treatment measure we did, and I think that was prolier in this lady, uh, really you can see a huge improvement after that, and they got back into osteopenic range, which I, I was talked about. Next slide, please. And again, at the hip, last one of these, some people love their DEXA scans and love seeing others, but up to not. I apologize if this has been boring for you. But again, you can see whatever measure we did with the right hand graph, the, the dots there are what happened over time. There was improvement, a real dip, and then the next treatment, which I think was probably for this lady, um, did improve. And she was she's doing great guns. Osteopenia after she could have been osteoporotic. So I, I love to show ladies their scans and, and men too. <laughs> Um, and they like to see them sometimes too. If you don't have a scan result like this, uh, a lot of the imaging places are just giving out a very crummy page report. You can request these. You just might need to push for it or get your doctor to push for these images, but it does need someone to interpret it. Uh, I can, as a specialist, gain access to these. Next slide, thank you. And this is just uh, to show the wrist at the bottom. We don't often do the wrist. The population statistics aren't great for the wrist. So you've got the spine at the top, the hip in the middle and the wrist. You can see the spine's gone down a bit. The hip went up, which was nice. The wrist went down. The wrist is a very bad measure on its own. Often we'll only do the wrist because you might've had a hip replacement and can't measure the hip. And then we're relying on the spine and the hip, but don't make decisions based on the wrist alone. Our next slide, thank you. So, um, my approach to the patient with osteopenia and osteoporosis, this is what I do. Diagnosis is very important. It'll be on your history. I'm a specialist. Someone has always referred uh, you to me. So your GP would have done a DEXA scan or done other tests or an X-ray and you might have found, found very thin bones and you might have had a fracture. So a fracture, uh, I will always investigate. Um, I investigate for causes of bone thinning. So I won't just say, oh, you're postmenopausal, this is postmenopausal osteoporosis. I will always say, well, there might be a cause. We need to investigate. We need to see if there's something that I can treat or someone else can treat. So I do a panel of blood tests and urine tests. Uh, we just do that once. It is a fair few tests, but it just makes sure that there's nothing there that we can treat. Then I educate about bone health. So I talk about the things I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. I get them to maximize calcium within diet. I'm gonna blitz this in a minute. I want them to have adequate vitamin D. There's a lot of controversy about calcium and vitamin D. Do they help? Do they harm? Can they hurt arteries? Can they help bone or avoid fracture? But if you've got osteopenia or osteoporosis, my prerogative is have enough calcium in diet and have adequate vitamin D levels. I want you to be maximizing weight bearing exercise that's appropriate for you and appropriate for bones, we'll go through that. And sometimes medications are, are necessary. Next slide, thank you. So calcium, calcium, I want people to be having calcium through their diet. There are clear recommendations out there. Uh, if you're listening or watching this, I think you're probably gonna be at least 18 plus. So you'll be needing at least 1,000 milligrams of calcium per day. You can see men up to 70 need up to 1,000, 1,700 after that, as do postmenopausal women. You can get calcium through your diet. And let's have a look at the next slide, please. So there's, I, this is just me Googling calcium content of food. You can get it through whatever website. Uh, this is a lovely page which talks about the calcium content of food. What I get my patients to do, write out their food intake for a day. You only need to do it once. Look at the different foods 
tot it up against one of these tables that tells you how much calcium is within different food groups and then work out if you're deficient. If you are, try and increase it through diet. I know some people can't have dairy. I know some people can't do it through diet. If not, I think you're going to need a calcium supplement if you're osteopenic or osteoporotic to take you up to 1300 milligrams per day. Most calcium supplements have 600 milligrams per day. There's a lovely uh, commercially available in the supermarket tin of tuna. It's got a man's name on it, so you'll be able to find that. Um, I'm not trying to screw brands or anything, but it has it's fortified with calcium, and that's a really good way of getting a, a, a really a good amount of calcium without having to have bucket loads of milk, etc. Not that that's a bad thing. Don't get that wrong. Next slide, thank you. So there's some tips there. Three serves of dairy per day if you can. Spinach got lots of calcium. Snack on almonds. So things that you might not uh, realise have calcium do. Uh, plain yogurt to soups is a good way to do it. Fruit smoothies. So there's lots of um, tricks and traps with this. There's some beautiful calcium rich recipes on the Jean Hales for Women's Health website. And I've got a link to that later on. Uh, have a look. You'll be surprised at what you can do to make calcium interesting. Next slide. Thank you. So vitamin D is very important. Uh, it's very controversial as well. Some people say don't supplement with vitamin D. The government don't want us to measure it because it's expensive for them. But if you've got osteopenia or osteoporosis, I want you to have a vitamin D level between 75 and 125 because in population studies, that has been shown uh, to have the best protective effect in terms of bone health. Uh, and if you've got a very, very, very low level of vitamin D, remember rickets and the bowed legs type thing, that was what people used to get when they didn't have good sunlight exposure. We don't see rickets anymore, but I do see some very, very low vitamin D levels. And this is very amenable to treatment. Next slide, please. So vitamin D uh, helps the absorption of calcium. So bones need that. Remember, bones are running on calcium uh, and have our biggest store of calcium. So vitamin D and the parathyroid hormone, which is on the surface of the thyroid, called parathyroid, um, they help the absorption of calcium through the gut and they also deposit it onto the bones and will take calcium away from the bones as well. So vitamin D is very important for that. And some of my ladies have got a vitamin D level of 16 or 11 or 25, and that's abject deficiency. We want to get out into the sun, but we don't want to get a skin cancer. If you can't go out in the sun, if you're inside working or whatever or caring for others, you need to just take some vitamin D. And again, be guided by your doctor and be guided by some good advice. And I'm going to um, show you some good uh, websites about that. Uh, but there's also deep sea fish has a lot of vitamin D. That's interesting in itself eggs, etc. There's a lot of ways you can get vitamin D through food, but many of us, especially if we live in sort of below Sydney, will need to supplement unless we're going to a sunny region in our winter. And the next slide, please, uh, is a nice graph of what happens with vitamin D where you live. And I apologise if you're outside of Australia, but this is a lovely map. So I'm going to start talking about the Healthy Bones Australia website. It's brilliant. Uh, this is a map from their website telling you about what sort of sun exposure you will need to have an adequate vitamin D in the different regions of Australia in summer and in the cooler months. Uh, so you'll need a lot in Tasmania and Melbourne in winter and you're not going to get three hours of sunlight per day. Um, so have a look at the Healthy Bones Australia website for what's recommended, but always do it in a safe way. We don't want wrinkles, we don't want skin cancers. Um, and we don't want to age quickly. Uh, and you can get vitamin D in a convenient and cheap tub at the chemist and at the supermarket. Next slide, please. So exercise. Um, exercise is very important. I know you'll have some very excellent and curly questions for me, but I'm going to tell you that you can find some really great information about this. There is some on the Jean Hales for Women's Health website, Better Health, uh, website as well, and also on the Healthy Bones Australia website. Very targeted exercise specific information on that latter website, Healthy Bones Australia. We want to be doing weight bearing. Remember, I talked about worms crawling through the ground. Worms do not need bones or skeleton because they don't weight bear, uh, they just tunnel through the earth. If we're standing up and we want to do so for the rest of our lives, we need to do weight bearing exercise. 
Resistance training is also very important. We want to make sure that the muscles and tendons and everything around the joints are supporting our bones, which are supporting us, and also balance. It's no good having strong bones if you're going to fall over and fracture. Uh, so balance is very important. And I always suggest, because remember I'm seeing people with osteopenia that might be severe or osteoporosis or osteopenia plus fracture, which we treat a bit differently, I'm often suggesting a GP care plan. So a GP care plan is a specialised plan whereby a GP uh, needs to organise and agree to it. I suggest that they organise it. I will be part of that if they want me to be. But an exercise physiologist is like a physio. They're a biomechanics expert. Uh, they are someone who knows about bodies. They know about osteopenia. They know about osteoporosis. They know about exercise. It's their specialty. They can give you a program that will maximise your bone density and reduce your risk, hopefully, of fracture. And I really rely on exercise physiologists a lot. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, this is a lovely um, link here. Healthy Bones Australia. That's what it looks like. There's a beautiful brochure. I think it's eight pages long. You can really gain access to it. It's got some beautiful pictures of the types of exercise we recommend for bone health. And it's got some stunning recommendations about what to do depending on your risk, depending if you're normal, post osteopenia or osteoporosis. So if you've got questions about exercise, I think, uh, and, and doctors generally aren't good with exercise and, and guidance for bone health. I'm always saying, talk to your exercise physiologist, uh, talk to your physio. Some physios definitely are aware of bone health, not all. Um, and the people at the gym, just make sure that they have expertise here if they're giving you a program. And I think it's always useful uh, to rely on expert advice here. But have a look at this lovely brochure if you're interested in exercise for bone health. Uh, it's very comprehensive uh, and very easy to access and see and understand. Next slide, please. And this is the, essentially uh, the recommendations from Healthy Bones Australia. So you'll see there, there's uh, stratifications there for normal, uh, medium risk or low risk for osteopenia and higher risk if there's existing osteoporosis. You don't want to do very high impact exercise. If you've already got osteoporosis, you want to take it a bit slower than that. You don't want to have a fracture, which is why you need good advice and you need guidance here. It's no good just finding that you've got a thin bone, going out and doing something and then injuring yourself. Uh, that's what this is not all about. We want to do it safely. Next slide, please. So the recommended activities for bone health. Weight-bearing exercises, so walking, that's not just a dawdle. All right, I know it's still weight-bearing. You want to do a brisk walk. You want to be getting some gusto out of it. You want to be sweating a bit. Uh, if you can, I know that not everyone can do this. If it's a decision between doing a walk, even if it's a dawdle and no walking, I'll go with whatever walk you can do. Um, hiking, very good, because uh, you, you again, stair climbing type thing. Jogging, if you can do it, but don't decide you're a jogger if you're not a jogger already. Do it in a stepwise fashion. Start with a walk, go to a brisk walk, start putting in a few uh, bits of running. Get good shoes, make sure you're safe, make sure it's in a good and sturdy environment, because most fractures with falls are because of environment. We'll go through that in a minute with a picture of a cat. Um, I'm going to wow you with that. Uh, resistance training, so that's doing weight. And again, someone can guide you here. Don't just invent your own program. It's all been done before. Just get someone to say, this is what you should do, and just say, all right, I'm worried about my bone health. I'm going to do it. Um, and so impact exercises that are high impact, aerobics, running, excuse me, dance. Uh, some of my ladies do Greek or Israeli dancing. Some do Zumba. Brilliant for bones, that sort of jolty, jolty, skipping, hopping type movement is very good for bone density. Um, and balance training, so yoga and Pilates are very good for those. So what we don't recommend, um, dynamic abdominal exercise. So sit-ups, the, the really rapid crunching thing about the spine. If you have osteoporosis already, I wouldn't be doing that. Uh, if you've got normal bone density, yes, you can do those things. Twisting movements, so golf swings. So I often feel quite... Uh, cruel because I say to the ladies, oh, I might say, what are you doing for exercise? Oh, golf. Well, golf's good for walking and weight bearing, but the swings is where I'm worried about. Swimming. Swimming's great for heart, 
but it isn't doing anything for bone density. So I'm often saying to my ladies, well, I wish you'd just swim once a week instead of five times and do weight bearing on the other day. Uh, so I'm, I am a bit mean sometimes, but you want my ladies and my some of my men, and I don't have many of those, they come to me saying, I want good bone health. I don't want to have a problem. I don't want to have a fracture. They're very interested and very motivated. And that's why you're listening, uh, which, is, which is great. Sudden jerking movements you don't want and high impact exercises uh, are not recommended for those who have existing osteoporosis. Uh, next slide, please. So we're talking about medications. Your doctor will give you some guidance about these. They need to prescribe them. It will, base, it will depend on you, depending on your past history, your risk factors, your DEXA scan, where you're at, and also PBS. So the government have funded some medications for bones and not others. Hormone therapy I'll talk about, the bisphosphonate group, riloxifene is also called Evista, um, denosumab is called Prolia, Parathyroid hormone is also under known as the name Forteo or teriparatide. And this one's spelled wrong, I do apologize. It's Romo, not Roso. Romosozumab, I always think of Romeo, uh, which is the newest agent. Uh, very hard to get access to that. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide, please. So if you are a postmenopausal lady or around the time of menopause and you're in the 50s typically or late 40s to uh, 60, I will often, and if you've got symptoms, it's very easy. If you've got flushes, sweats, don't sleep, and your mood is impacted and you feel like uh, you're not normal because of menopause, it's very easy to talk about hormone therapy. So it's estrogen if you have uh, a womb only, e uh, no womb, I'm sorry, uh, estrogen and progesterone if you've had a hysterectomy. Um, so I've said that wrong. <laughs> Trying to not say it wrong. If you've had a hysterectomy, you only need estrogen. If you have your womb still in, you need the estrogen plus the progesterone. We've got it sorted now. <laughs> All right. um, so those women who have looked through the information are happy to accept the risk and have symptoms, it's very easy. It will stop bone loss and bones should improve. So remember I said bones grow and bones fall away. It will stop the loss so bones can quietly grow. Um, it will relieve menopausal symptoms. It has in studies been shown to reduce fracture. Slight increase in breast cancer if there's more than five to four to five years of use. Risk of bleeding or DBT if you're on a tablet form of estrogen. Not all products are on the PBS. And it might not be for you. You might have a strong family history of breast cancer. You might have had breast cancer yourself. We can't use this always. Next slide, please. Which is why I'm always grateful that there's the bisphosphonate group. This has been around for ages. There are uh, tablets which are weekly or monthly. And there's an infusion. So they go by the brand names. I've written the generic names there, but Fosamax, Actinel, and Aclaster is the 12 month infusion. Um, if you are a man or a lady over 50 with osteoporosis and a prior minimal fracture, you have a PBS subsidy. These medications are quite cheap though. So if you do have osteo osteopenia and a fracture, you can gain access to these. They're not expensive. You'll only get a five to seven year treatment benefit, but the benefit can be quite long term. Unlike hormone therapy and unlike prolia that I'll talk about in a minute, uh, the, bone, the, the loss starts again when you go off treatment with the others, but not with this one. It just stays around for a long time. Um, it's incorporated into the bone long term, strengthens from within, prevents fracture. Main side effects, tummy upset to start with. Some will get reflux. So if you have severe reflux, sometimes this isn't a good option for you. Um, there is a very rare risk of what's called osteonecrosis of the jaw, less than one in 10,000. I've only seen three cases, they were very sick people. And that is a non-healing part of the inside of the jaw. If you would have an extraction, et cetera, that would increase your risk on these medications. This is specialist care though. If you need this, uh, talk to your dentist first, but don't avoid these medications if there's just normal dental work to be done, but talk to your dentist. Um, there is an increased risk of atypical fractures after five to seven years of treatment. Therefore, I don't usually extend it beyond that. Next slide, please. Prolia. So Prolia is uh, a, one of the newest agents and it's an injection under the skin every six months. What it does, remember I said bone grows and bone falls away. The cells that chew up bone, this is like birth control for them. If they're not replicating, they're falling away bone density grows. Uh, so you'll, you will improve your bones. It's very effective. It only works while you're using it. And we only have uh, access to this 
if there's osteoporosis and fracture or osteoporosis and you're older than 70, uh, 70 plus. So often that zero birthday is an exciting one because we can gain access to uh, prolia. Uh, some have some aches and pain, some have a local reaction very infrequently. There's the same risk of the osteonecrosis of the jaw, very rare. Um, there is an increased risk of fracture in the first year after stopping treatment. Hence, we tend to keep going with treatment if you're on prolia. Next slide, please. Nearly there. Thank you for your patience. Evista is a daily tablet only for postmenopausal women. I don't find it useful often because it's only good for the spine, not for the hip. Some women will get some flushes and sweats. There's an increased risk of DBT, but a decreased risk of breast cancer. It acts doing the good things that estrogen does, but it blocks the bad thing that it does. So if this is very novel, not for everyone, I don't use it a lot, but can be very useful. Next slide, please. For Teo, you need specialist guidance for. It's a daily injection, which is hard to sell to people because they need to learn to do it themselves for 18 months, sometimes longer. Um, you need to have severe osteoporosis and other treatments are ineffective. So I just, when I first meet someone say, these are all the treatments, and I sort of say, well, you don't need hormone therapy, you don't need Forteo, it's so something in the middle. So it's easy to cut, uh, to, to sort of exclude these medications. Uh, you need to have at least two fractures with one occurring whilst on another medication. Has to be prescribed by a specialist. Calcium can go up, there can be some dizziness, cramps and nausea. We don't use this very often, but some people will need it. Next slide, please. And the now correctly spelled Romasozumab, uh, Evenity, is funny because you need two injections at once per month. Uh, this is for severe osteoporosis when other treatments are ineffective and two or more fractures and one whilst on another treatment. You can only have it by a specialist. When you look at the information, there's a list as long as your arm and as long as someone's leg uh, that says the, all the reasons you can't have it. So I haven't had, even though I've got quite severe patients at times, I haven't had someone who's suitable for this medication yet, so I haven't used it. Uh, but it's just the newest kid on the block. Next slide, please. Getting to the end, well done. Um, visit your doctor. If you're worried about your bone health, talk to your friendly doctor. Talk to them about having a DEXA scan performed if you need it. Uh, your doctor can advise you about whether you need to do one, what to do for your bone health. But have a look at these websites first because they are excellent and I'll go through those. I'll link to them at the end. Next slide, please. Um, don't be afraid of asking your doctor questions. I have lots of questions every time and I'm not afraid of them. Um, what do what the medications do? There's side effects, how long will that be on them? Just have a good think, target your questions, write them down. There's lots of things. People get very worried about their bones and about the treatment. I always look at women and I say, you don't want to have osteopenia or osteoporosis, do you? And they say, no. And they say, you don't really want the treatment either. And they say, no. And I say, well, we've got to do something. We're doing all the other things. Your bones are severely affected enough that we do need uh, some medication treatment for your bones. Next slide, please. Falls. I know people don't like to hear falls because it makes them think, oh, I'm old or whatever. I've fallen. Many of my ladies have fallen. So a lady uh, was going to go water skiing. I was terribly worried about her bones, but she said, don't worry, Sonia. I was on my bike and fell off my bike and had a fracture instead. So, uh, so people can fall. It's about environment. So be very careful if you have osteoporosis or osteopenia of your environment. A third of people over 65 fall every year um, and 10 to 15% can lead to fracture. Uh, if you don't have good muscle strength and if you don't have poor, good balance or poor eyesight or inappropriate footwear or rugs on the floor or whatever that you're going to trip on, you're going to have a fall. So be very careful of the environment, especially in an unfamiliar place. Next slide, please. So that's where the cat is. Remember, you can trip on the cat in the night. So I've had ladies who've done that. Uh, the dog got in the way. They were multitasking. They were looking after grandchildren. They fell down the stairs. Falls can happen. Just be very, very aware of your environment and what you're doing. Don't multitask. Eliminate clutter. Make sure your environment's uh, safe. Have good shoes. Get your glasses on if you need glasses. Um, use walking aids if you need them. And exercise to improve your balance. The cat's there so you don't fall over the cat. Next slide, please. There are lots of resources out there. 
Jean Hale for Women's Health is at the top. You'll have lots of women's health information, but some very lovely information about bone health, calcium, vitamin D as well. Uh, menopause.org.au, that's the Australasian Menopause Society, a very lovely, specific five-page information sheet that I think I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, Healthy Bones Australia, brilliant. Just They'll talk about calcium, they'll talk about vitamin D, they'll talk about exercise. All of the questions that you think, for me, you have for me, they'll be on their website answered. Um, and betterhealth.big.gov.au, a Victorian government initiative, very lovely information uh, that is heavily scrutinised. Uh, next slide, thank you. And we're almost at the end. This is uh, that information page from the Australasian Menopause Society, targeted for women, but it's got some good information that men might gain from as well. It's five pages. It goes through all of this sort of thing in a lovely summary document with the uh, treatments. And this is at Australasian Menopause Society, menopause.org.au. Next slide, thank you. There is lots of information at Jean House for women's health, particularly for women. Men might find some information there too, especially about bones, but it might be about their partner or their loved one or their mother or whoever. I've been delighted to speak with you tonight. I, I love bone health. I want everyone to have healthy bones. I think we're looking at the last slide now, which is where I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I've put people through some hell tonight, but I'm a, it's a pleasure to speak, and I'm really delighted to be fielding your questions, which um, Jen will forward my way. Thank you so much for having me speak. <clears throat> Sonia, thank you so much for an incredibly comprehensive presentation. Um, it, uh, it really, I've, I've been taking some notes for my personal use as well while I've been listening to you and I'm sure everyone this evening and, and a lot of the questions that have come up, um, given we've only got a very short time to cover a couple of questions, um, it's important to say of course Musculoskeletal Australia also has our uh, national helpline, uh, the number I mentioned earlier, the 1800 263 265. Um, we have, which is um, staffed by two registered nurses. So if anyone has some questions following the webinar, we can always cover them there. Just a, a quick couple of questions that have come in, Sonia, before we need to finish. Um, if people uh, need to log off, they're certainly welcome to. Um, but I, I think a lot of the questions have been covered by the information in the presentation. Um, there was just a question about calcium supplementation and any cardiac issues. Is, has there been, is there any evidence around that? So, so what happened was uh, there was a study whereby women older than 70 were given two grams of calcium per day. So if you remember back to the uh, guidelines, we want you to be having 1,000 milligrams or 1,300 milligrams uh, as, as adult men and women. So these women were given a lot more than that and they were also having their dietary calcium. So they were having a lot. There was a question mark as to whether they calcified their, their heart arteries, which meant calcified arteries is, is a risk factor of having a heart attack. But when they looked at all the information that they thought, no, there wasn't an increased risk of calcification of the arteries in those women compared to those who had dummy treatment. But for those reasons, we're trying to have calcium to a safe level within diet, but if you can't get it within diet, have the calcium supplement, which usually has 600 milligrams per day. <clears throat> and uh, someone's asked a question that if they have psoriatic arthritis, uh, are they eligible for a subsidised DEXA scan? But I'm thinking not, it wasn't on your list. Yeah, it, it just, um, it depends what, what other risk factors. So if you might have had prednisolone at high dose, so talk to your doctor. Um, you can, if you're very sneaky, uh, you don't have to really be sneaky, but if you're very canny, you can look at Medicare item numbers for DEXA scan. It, do you know what? Even if you have to pay $100 or so out of pocket, I know that's a lot of money for a lot of people, but $100 out of pocket for a DEXA scan if you don't have a Medicare item number uh, to give you a free scan, it's a worthwhile investment. And my ladies have always said, God, I'm glad I did that. I wasn't eligible for a payment for it, but I did it. Um, and it will give you some good information. It's an investment in your future health. And $100, I think, would be very worthwhile spending. Depends on, on the lab, what, how much you'll be out of pocket. 
Um, someone else has asked if you have celiac disease and irritable bowel syndrome at a young age, does that reduce your ability to increase your bone mineral density? Um, and would you still ultimately with the right treatment be able to um, achieve the same maximum bone density as someone um, who, who didn't have those problems at a younger age? Uh, it's a great question. My ladies with celiac disease, uh, as long as the celiac disease is treated and you're avoiding gluten and you're having enough calcium in the diet and adequate levels of vitamin D, if your celiac really isn't active, there should be nothing that would stop you from having normal bone density and with doing well on the other on medications as you need them. But just don't be too thin. I know some people with a celiac diet uh, can be thin. Uh, you want to be, the other important thing is be a healthy weight for your height. So that's BMI. The ones who have a bigger weight than their height need and the ones who have too little weight on their body for their height uh, have a low BMI. They are the people who will uh, be at increased risk of osteoporosis and osteopenia. So be a healthy weight for your height would be uh, what I'd be tending. But normal, normal people with celiac disease who do their diet religiously, they, they do well. And um, with regards to the bisphosphonates, is there any difference between uh, those couple that were mentioned there, the zolondric acid and the uh, alendronate? Are they fairly equivalent? Um, so the, the first one that was introduced was alendronate or Fosamax. Uh, we know the most about this. It's the longest acting, uh, but it might not be as kind on the tummy. So I usually will try and use alendronate first because we know the most about it. It's been around for years. Uh, and again, five to seven years of use. And I like to use a weekly tablet, not a monthly, because I think some people get still ill on a monthly tablet when it's all given at once. But Actinel or Resedronate, uh, Actinel EC is enteric coated. It's a brilliant way of doing it uh, because, you know, it's kinder to tummies, there's less reflux symptoms. Uh, and if someone doesn't tolerate the alendronate well, I'll go to the Resedronate, which is, which is the Actinel EC. And many of my ladies who didn't tolerate the first will tolerate the second. It's got a slightly less long half-life, but you'll still get a long acting benefit and five to seven years of treatment benefit. After that, uh, you might not, the bone, bone density might not go up anymore, and that does sign to say, well, we need to look at something else. And if someone has osteopenia, are they able to get a referral to a specialist, um, like an endocrinologist? Uh, yeah, it's, it's about what your GP will be happy to do, and uh, it might be about payment. So you might not get a public hospital um, visit to an endocrinology clinic on those basis because they're chock a block with people with osteoporosis and fracture who are, who are quite unwell. But if you are prepared to go privately, um, one good way of doing it is to talk with your doctor. They'll, they'll know the endocrinologist and people with an interest in bone health around them uh, and in your locale. But the Endocrine Society of Australia, the ESA, will also list endocrinologists in your area and their interests. So some are diabetic experts. Some have menopause and bones and thyroid or whatever uh, like I do, and some will just be bone. So have a look at the Endocrine Society Australia website. Of course, sometimes it's very difficult to book in with a specialist waiting list and whatever. Talk to your GP. They are the best person to know this area. And if you do look on a website and say, I'd like to see this doctor here, talk to your GP about it. Uh, it's a great idea. Have some, have some oomph. There's nothing like having low bone density for getting people motivated and saying, I want this to happen. I, I, I love it when they say, I'm going to do this, and they, I just, they just do it. I, I love it. And one last question. Um, uh, uh, osteo, if someone has osteoarthritis, can it lead to osteoporosis? No, they're very, and your website might be very useful for this purpose, um, actually. Osteoarthritis is a very different process. Osteoarthritis is degeneration of the bones uh, where cartilage can become worn after years of sports or just supporting the skeleton. It can lead to pain. It can be a genetic and a hereditary thing. That's where people get confused. They say, oh, I've got hip pain. I must have osteoporosis. No, you've got hip pain. You might have bursitis or osteoarthritis. And that's what commonly leads to hip replacements not osteoporosis unless you slip on a beam at a major supermarket and fracture you and smash your hip. That's when you need a hip replacement because of osteoporosis. 
Mm. This and we'll finish on the way right on 8.20, um, which we've uh, allowed uh, the, the, the possibility of going beyond our normal finishing time because of the late start. So look, Sonia, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and for persevering with the technical issue at the beginning. Thanks to everyone in the audience for also uh, waiting while we resolve that issue at the start. Uh, please, uh, you will receive the recording of this webinar presentation this evening and uh, so you'll be able to review it, uh, which I'm sure you will. You can do it as many times as you like freely because uh, it certainly contains a lot of wonderful information, a lot of website contacts and so on. And remember, there's also the musculoskeletal health uh, uh, national helpline on 1800 263 265. On that note, thank you again, Sonia. Thank you, everyone, and I wish everyone a good night. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jen.